Andy, we're all alone today. And we're not so much cuddling either. No, on it's the, not. On the cuddle couch. I mean, I thought about moving a little bit closer or, you know, <laughs> to balance bit. things out a little bit farther <laughs> little away. But so I'm just trying to find a comfortable spot. The cuddle couch is empty. On the cuddle couch. It's very empty today. Hi, so. folks out there in DTLT today land. So Jim is off at Penn State. Martha's gone for the day. Yep. So it's you and me, which means we get to talk about what we want to talk about. Again, the true media empire exactly. is, is left in DuPont to figure everything out. Right. All the idea people are gone now. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. We're left to our own devices. We're, we're the idea people, the big idea people. There you go. So we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, we've, there's a couple of things that prompted, I think, today's discussion. One, one of them being the Netflix, Netflix announcement right. that talked about splitting or more, more specifically defining the two businesses that, that Netflix is going to go forward with. Yeah. One is their streaming side or separate streaming business, and then the DVD side. Which isn't really a new announcement. They'd, no. They'd, I think it was two months ago where they said, you know, we're, we're making them two separate businesses. This just kind of clarified it. The CEO said they actually are two separate businesses now with separate names and separate right. websites and separate logins. I think the login actually stays the same, but you can change the password and it won't pass over to the other. There's separate websites altogether. Right, and it was kind of an overwrought um, apology that, that came along with it. Like, we apologize for not telling you more about what our plans were, um, and I, but I can't say that it's still clear what their plan is. Yeah. Because one of the issues that I have with, with the DVD stuff is is that's where all the, the kind of difficult to get uh, video is, mm -hmm. and if if they're looking to eventually go to all streaming, the mail-in mail service, the mail-in service, That's right? All that stuff. Yeah. Um, if they're looking to kind of go to an all streaming service eventually, which I mean, obviously, I think that's way the way every market is going. Eventually, yeah, um, I would think they're they're not increasing their volume of of streaming content by any means, and in some cases, they're kind of going backwards with with the stars deal falling through and and that sort of thing. So. Um, but that prompted a discussion between Tim and I, and, and then we, we always like to get into these nostalgic discussions with, with just about anybody here in DTLT about video and, and specifically media centers. Mm -hmm. And so I think we'll talk a little bit about what we use at home, what we've used in the past, um, where we've come from. Um, well, what's funny is when you mentioned it, you said, you know, what's your home theater like setup like, Tim? And I said, you mean my lack of one? <laughs> I, I really don't have anything. You and know, then I felt bad. No, I mean, here's the thing. It was just like by the time DVRs came around to where they were the norm with DirecTV, with Dish Network, and all of them, it's like I lost interest in sort of the DIY mm -hmm. mindset. Mm -hmm. But the thing was, the more I thought about it, I, I got nostalgia because I really was really into all of this stuff. Absolutely. I mean, building your own computer, loading the software and stuff like that. And it's just like that's sort of fallen off for me anyway to the point where it's just like, you know, I have the set-top box that comes with the company mm -hmm. that I'm with, and it does most of what I need. Yeah. Now... You know, with unlimited funds and a you know to complete budget to do whatever I want. Yeah, there's some things that I'd love to right. do there. But well, one of the things that and and when we talked about the history, it, it started out for me with a a PC, and I dabbled in the Windows Media Center stuff, and and that is so um, kind of direct connect centric in, in the sense mm -hmm. of you needed to have some kind of either set top box or direct cable input into a card that would then allow you to do the recordings and that sort of thing. And then you would also have the, the photo application and the music application. Right. And it was also Windows Media based, which which kind of, if you were in the Windows world, that was okay. <laughs> but things and were starting. Were. <laughs> and I was. <laughs> yeah. But things started to change over to the H.264, and that compression technique got mm -hmm. to, to, to be very popular, some of the set-top boxes for the satellite. Right. Um, companies like DirecTV were starting to move move over to H.264, whereas they were MPEG-2 up to a certain point. And one of the first pieces of software that I, I started to use was called Beyond... T actually, it was called Beyond Media. Beyond Media. And then it yeah. switched to Beyond TV. And that was a it was a PC software that would do the recording from your set-top box. And right. it would require things like a, 
um, an IR blaster that would allow you to change the channels and, and that sort of thing. I, I kind of bypassed that and just left my TV on at the right channel and, mm -hmm. and would record stuff at night if I needed to from there. I'd, I have your pimping set up in a picture here, and I think I would be doing By all means, viewers let, an injustice people, yeah. to not show people how just slick that this uh, setup that Andy had was. Yeah. Slick so, is one word for it. Yeah, this, this was his very cool... Um, <laughs> home theater PC setup. This is a Panasonic 31 inch tube TV mm. um, that I bought I think even 10 years or so before. I think 1996 is when I got this and this was probably 2002 somewhere around there mm -hmm. um, that, I'm, that I'm showing off this pimped out system. Um, and this of course, it, I mean basically it's just a PC underneath sideways with a DVD burner yeah. Um, and that so that also was my DVD player, but I also had an outboard DVD box as well. Um, and that's one of the things that the Media Center always was difficult to use uh, in, in that way was, was as a DVD player. Mm -hmm. um, because you always had the software that was kind of clunky or didn't support every, all the menu features and, and you couldn't, you didn't necessarily have just one remote that you could point. You may in some cases had to use a keyboard to, to log in or to do different things or to get dif to different areas on the PC just to start the DVD program. So right. it was still very clunky um, to try to um, get things going. But And I, someone is mentioning um, Myth, TV, Myth TV, which was the Linux yeah, version that of was, something Yeah, that was the Linux line. software. And I, 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 I don't think you dabbled in it much, but I, no. I jumped in just barely. And I, I mean, it was never where I wanted it to be the I, Linux stuff. And now they've got actual like Ubuntu distributions mm -hmm. that are set up for Myth TV and those exactly. are supposedly a little bit better. At the time it was almost like you had to do it yourself even in that regard with yeah. all the settings and config files and hope, you know, the display drivers and stuff like that. Myth Boon is it Myth really called Myth Ubuntu? Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, there was, and there was another one called that we researched this morning called Sage TV and that was another that was a competitor to Beyond TV and, and mm -hmm. competitor is kind of a a loose word, I guess, because, yeah. because a lot of these kind of had this open source feel to them. Yeah. Beyond TV, I think, was more of a commercial, a solid commercial product. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where I wanted to go. And it, and it worked really well. well and Beyond I don't know if you TV, have... Beyond you have, TV, you can actually still buy. I mean, they're, yep. when you go to their website anyway, it still shows that you can buy it. But I doubt they're not really doing much in the way of sales of that anymore, certainly. Yeah, and I think I the imagine. last time that I actually used Beyond TV was the 2008 time frame. And they had version 4.9, I think, which yeah. is where they are right now. So they really haven't done anything. Yeah. And they've gone the route of, of um, kind of LAN DVR servers where um, right. corporations or educational institutions or whatever would, would be able to record any TV from anywhere and kind of use those clips and repurpose yeah. them. Um, kind of like The Daily Show does, does their recordings of TV all day long and then they're able to take their clips and use them in the, in the TV show to do the parodies and that Which sort of thing. Which is kind of a smart thing to do rather yeah. than when, you know, as, as opposed to your whole business collapsing, you move towards the enterprise and think mm -hmm. of in, interesting solutions in that regard. So, um, not so, a bad thing. So from beyond TV, um, I think I, st I still tried to, I moved into a new new house in 2008 mm -hmm. and tried to kind of incorporate the PC into the into the new home theater that, that I had set up, um, that I have set up. Um, mm -hmm. But that was about the time where I started to uh, get into the Macintosh realm. Oh, and, and um, I should show people oh, your, your 2.0 version. That's right. Don't forget, don't forget this is 2.0. This 2. is Andy's and setup 2.0. <laughs> and I just love this because it's like that slick new TV, yeah. awesome speaker system, yep. and there's that Dell Dimension box right yeah. down there. I really could have done just very well with this image by focusing on the TV screen right. and yeah, nothing just, else. Just forget, it, forget the computer underneath. Um, <laughs> but I was big. And if you, if you even zoomed out a little bit further, oh, yeah, there's the all the garbage cradle. and the crap in the corner, like the wireless keyboards that I would that I would try to use to, right. <laughs> to get all this stuff to work. Um, so, so and, and after Beyond TV and, and the transition, I would have all these recordings on my hard drive that were in MPEG-2 format. Mm -hmm. And you could either burn them directly to a DVD with the, with the Beyond TV software, or you would convert them into something else. And, and at the time, really H.264 was starting to, um, re even in the PC side, let alone the Macintosh, was really starting to push into that. Um, to, to the to the Windows market, so um, it was decision time, kind of, and so mm. um, I decided 
and and we talked a little bit about this too. We 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 both kind of drooled at the at the shuttle PC boxes, the the right. really small kind of compact PC boxes, yeah, with, with the or home, the long the, the with the home theater PC thing. It was like it wasn't just about the software that you were loading, but very much about the computer that you put it in. Exactly, and so you wanted it something like, sleek that fit into a tight space. You might have had a, had a cube action with right. the shuttle PC, or yeah, you you wanted something that looked like a set top box, even though it was a full on desktop operating system. And this was back before really, you know, processors got so good. You know, like now you look at the Apple TVs and things like that, and there's no running fans. It's right. completely silent. That wasn't like that back then, and it's still really not if you're building a full-on Windows PC desktop. No, um, and, and it, it, after the the Windows PC stuff, it was it was. I've always kind of I had always kind of looked at the Mac Mini right. as the ideal kind of small box, yeah, very capable. And the only difficulty was trying to kind of integrate the video component into the TV because you'd have to have something with with like a VGA connector yeah. and then and then get adapters. the adapters that that right. would allow you to do that. So, um, but that's that's kind of where I where I moved on to as I was starting to use my MacBook Pro a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, the Mac Mini at home was my first Macintosh purchase, uh -huh. um, and I used that and, and integrated that. and And Front Row was was in many ways ideal um, to do the kinds of things that I wanted. It was a very simple interface. You couldn't necessarily integrate things like Netflix and some of the other services. You'd have to go out to um, either something like Boxy TV, mm -hmm. um, uh, XBMC was an, was another kind of open source piece of software that right. you could load on a Mac that would allow you to tie into all those different kind of podcast services and, and Netflix and, and Pandora or whatever. Um, so, so you were actually using a Mac Mini, like a full-on yep. computer, not the Apple TV that yep. came later. And and the advantage of, I discovered v very early on, the advantage of the Mac Mini was I had a Logitech, um, one of the all-in-one remote uh, controllers, uh -huh. and it mapped its controls identically to what the Apple remote that came with the Mac Mini and, and come with a lot of the, uh, the Mac computers these days, um, it would map those controls almost identically. So when you put the push the menu button on the Logitech remote, it was the same as hitting the menu button on the Apple remote. Yeah. And so I could control a lot of the things on my Mac Mini with that remote. And then there was another piece of software called Remote Buddy, um, which would allow you to map different programs. So you could control what program you started. You'd still have to have like an on-screen keyboard or, or a wireless keyboard to, to type in passwords and that sort of thing. But um, for like the boxy and for other things, you could use the the Logitech remote, and that was nice because you could simply hit one button to turn everything on, right. and then you could control it um, with the same remote to do most of the things uh, in terms of starting software and, and well, controlling. Software. And it's interesting to see where some of this stuff is going now, because you mentioned Xbox Media Center, and there's mm -hmm. some other projects based on top of that. I think Plex is one of them. Yep. Um, there's a couple other projects that use <laughs> that as the core. <laughs> yeah, Plex is. Plex was. Have you ever played with it? I, I I played with all of them, and uh -huh. Plex was one of the ones that I that I favored at one time because it did a lot of things really well. Boxy, I was always kind of a clunky interface. Right. XBMC did some things better than Plex, and then Plex did some things better than XBMC. And of course, Boxy is doing their own hardware now, right? So they're working with D-Link, and you can actually buy a Boxy box exactly. with a, with a pretty decent remote. That comes with it that has an integrated keyboard on the other side of it, but it's yep. a you know handheld long remote and all that stuff conceptually seemed to be the way to go, yeah, but ultimately, what I have discovered, my favorite box of all of them that I've ever used is my apple t v two it simply and it doesn't have all the stuff on it that I need necessarily, and that's still somewhat problematic, but it right. does have the basics that i that I pretty much require. Um, Netflix, YouTube, Flickr, um, I can bring up any podcasts, mm -hmm. I can also bring in any media that I have on my Mac Mini that's running iTunes, that serves up any media that I have on there. So all the okay. mu music that I have in my iTunes library, all the movies that I have um, that I've ripped from my per my personal DVD collection, I can bring up any so of those movies. Have up. you cut your cable connection though? or do you? You, d you no, still I watch live TV, and, th that and that's thing. the thing: live sports, um, you know, right. football, hockey, cycling. I and and cycling is is I could I could probably watch on the internet, mm -hmm. um, but it, when, when it comes to the you know the the hockey and and the football and that sort of thing, 
um, it, it, it really is difficult if I want to get full HD and, and, that, and that great quality kind of experience watching those live games. You can, you can stream that stuff if you get the packages, sure. but the quality just isn't there. Right. And, I, and I prefer to watch that in, in full HD when I'm um, you know, watching it from my DVR. Right. Now what I do have um, in, integrated into that system also, and I do have the iTV software running on my Mac Mini. Okay. And what that allows me to do is, is record anything f directly you know, live or directly from my DVR box, which is a Motorola, part of the Fios system. Um, but that has component out that has HD quality into the uh, Hopog HD PVR box. So you're and doing all your recording on the Mac Mini, not on exactly. the DVR itself. Well, no. I'm actually recording it on the DVR, and it's, it's mostly because it's a fail-safe. Okay. You know, if I record it to the hard drive on the DVR, I've got it on the hard drive. Sure. And then what I do at a later time, um, it, it makes for more steps, but it, it is that fail-safe. Mm -hmm. So at a later time, what I do is I play the HD DVR, um, or the, I mean the, the DVR, it, it is HD, so I guess that is the right term, right. HD DVR through the Hopog box, which is component out from the DVR into the Hopog box, and it's just USB to the Mac Mini, and then the ITV software records that, and that gotcha. records that in, in, in full HD, H.264, and then you can go from there. Um, mm -hmm. If you use the Toast software, which is the Roxio product for uh, burning DVDs, right. this is the really this is one of the really cool things. Is if I've recorded something in HD, you can run it through the Toast software mm -hmm. and create a, an H a Blu-ray uh, copy of that content on a standard DVD. Oh, okay. So you don't have to have a Blu-ray burner, and that's one of the things that. Max never went towards yeah. is the idea of a of a Blu-ray uh, recording system, um, as as Steve Jobs famously said, it's a bag of hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and but the Toast software does allow you to. It's not it's as just, big a bag of hurt as the HD. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, the bag <laughs> of the, the the bag of hurt that was HD DVD that that I went that through you, and that you and held others. You, did? Yeah. Um, you know, I've still got those discs, and right. I eventually need to convert them into into something that's playable on a hard drive, but. Uh, now Bruce, uh, Bruce is a friend of mine. He says, "Why, why burn them unless you're sharing them? Or is that to give to other people? Or why would you burn to a disc as opposed to just having it on your drive?" Um, what it allows you to do instead, and and that's that, that that's what I was kind of alluding to with the with playing things back through the the DVD player in a in a computer as opposed to a regular full-on player. What it allows you to do is is take like co like a concert video uh -huh. um, and play that through your Blu-ray disc player. So instead of going in and, and finding the file and, and getting into that interface and, and m maybe being able to get a full high resolution quality video out of your computer and playing that, okay. um, playing it through the Blu-ray player really allows the... Uh, it, it, that's what that's what the Blu-ray format, the ABC HD uh, format, really is designed to do is is play through as kind of a standalone player. Okay. Now, when when Apple TV gets to the point where it's really handling like 1080p video mm -hmm. um, and the higher resolution videos, it'll it'll be better for this. But um, it's nice to be able to to pop in that concert video in your Blu-ray player and, and play it through that. Um, so there's it, there's there's pluses and minuses. Um, and I'm trying to follow some of the some of the yeah. chat now, um, but it, it all it all has to do kind of with the less work the better I guess is is what I'm shooting for, and and I'm hoping eventually um, the um, Apple TV box does things like the Amazon Video right. Prime the Prime Video stuff. Um, outputs at a higher output. Um, I'll need to upgrade my TV eventually because that really is only. Um, it's a it's a pan or a pioneer um, plasma that's a 720p TV. So it, it does a really good job. And, and plasma versus LCD is a, a completely different topic right. um, that we can maybe get into. So the at some Apple other TV time. it does 720. It doesn't do 1080. That's right. Gotcha. Um, and whether they can do a software update to that. Mm -hmm. And and another another interesting thing to um, to get to on the Apple TV is the idea of of the apps that are on the App Store. Right. And what could easily translate to to playing through your Apple TV box on your on your big screen television set? Right. Um, some the, of the stuff the OS that's on there is, is iOS. It's a different exactly. version of it, but it is iOS in the back end. Exactly. So some of those and and some of that stuff has to kind of translate to a to a controller. Like how do you play Angry Birds with your Logitech remote? Sure. Um, but but other things like 
um, you know, viewing documents in Instapaper or something mm -hmm. like that, where you can go in and you can read um, some of your offline content that you've saved, um, or uh, some of the Wikipedia programs and that sort of thing. To be able to bring those up on an Apple TV to look up some of that stuff, even with an on-screen, a simple on-screen keyboard. Well, and we're, we're already going to see little pieces of this with the display mirroring component that we're exactly. going to get in iOS 5. Right. And so games like, a, I think I saw one demo of a racing game yep. where you could have an iPod Touch that acts as your controller, but exactly. the game itself would be on the television set. Well, and that's a really good point that, that I, I'm glad you mentioned. The, both the iPhone and the iPad will essentially act as controllers of the of the Apple TV. Mm -hmm. So when you're watching content or when you're when you're looking at things on the screen that require you to type stuff in, all you need to do is is kind of grab your your other iOS device. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're on the same Wi-Fi network, which obviously at home I am, you just you kind of set that up to control the Apple TV. And so you can type in your passwords, you can type in um, little little bits of text or or do do search box stuff on the Apple TV and that allows you to to kind of go to that next step so it really is getting there with either an iPhone or a, or a iPad um, controlling that box we're we're almost there in terms of kind of the ideal home media center and it, and again you know the Apple TV is just this little hockey puck sized right, box exactly that, that fits in nicely um, anywhere in your in your media system and it looks nothing like that um, Dimension 4600 PC that <laughs> I come had a long way, underneath huh? my 31 inch Panasonic um, well, tube do, television. Do you see anything like in terms of value for things like the Google TV and this idea of like adding social features on top of it? I don't know, does the Apple TV do anything in the way of social features it, or it, being able to, you know, I don't know, having a browser inside of the thing that you're working with? Yeah, um, a, a browser on a TV in general I think is problematic. Yeah. Um, it's it's almost better just to like have an iPad for you to do browsing when you need to. And then right. and then what you what you're getting at is the is the kind of integration of the social media with like television watching. Yeah. Hey I'm watching you know the the latest uh, uh, how I Met Your Mother or right. whatever. And following um, a Twitter hashtag while you're exactly. watching the, the local news or something. Exactly. Right? And, and, and how this all kind of gets sorted out, I think, is, is still up in the air because right now Fios has their widgets. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a Twitter widget where you can be watching something and actually tweet out during a show. And it knows what show you're watching and, and things along that line. So um, some of the stuff, how it, how it ultimately gets packaged and, and figured out, I think, is still is still up in the air. Yeah, um, it's worth noting one of those old school companies, Sage, got bought out by Google, by Google. just yeah. this summer. Yeah, and, and we so. still don't know what, what kind of integration, as you mentioned, the Google TV, and I haven't yeah. played around or even looked at that because one of the one of the problems with that that I saw right away is that the whole thing was, was $300 right. to start with. Now, I think they've knocked it down in price. Yeah. Um, it might even be down to a hundred dollars at this point. Well, it's the same um, situation where Google's got what could be an interesting software platform, but they're at the whim of the device makers. You know, the Android's in the same situation. It's sort of like Google can do everything that they want to make the software user friendly, mm -hmm. but if Logitech Tech can't bring a device down to right. somewhere in the ninety-nine dollar range, it seems like at that point it's dead on arrival, just because of Apple TV, Roku, all the other players right. who have these tiny set-top boxes that can yeah. do so much already. I mean. One of the, as I've gotten further into the kind of the Apple ecosystem, I've just I've realized where they're going with this, and and it it can be somewhat pricey, um, but they and and the control that they have and the closed system I guess that they have where people some people look at that as a negative. Sure. It really turns out to be a positive in terms of how it integrates with everything. So there's there's. There's two kind of different ways that you can go as far as the small set-top boxes as, as, as it stands right now. And someone mentioned Roku. Um, Roku, has a, Roku has a lot of services that are built into their box. They right. have a lot more than the Apple TV, probably three or four times as many things that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and things that I wish that they would add to, the, to Apple TV like Pandora um, and, and some of this other stuff. And I also see things like Spotify um, mm -hmm. coming into the picture as well. Um, but if you're in the Apple iTunes kind of um, ecosystem, that's where you get to kind of add the iTunes stuff and what they're going to do with iTunes Match right. and the iCloud stuff that's coming down the pike. So um, over the next month or so, it's going to be really interesting to see how, how that goes forward. So, yeah. well, um, 
and we and, and again we this this could be an hour show <laughs> so could. we may want to do a part two at some point and and I think we today we've just started to kind of rehash some of this stuff mm -hmm. um, but I don't know as we really had any kind of uh, direction for it and wow. so I think um, what I'd like to do is just kind of get a listing of of, of what works now mm -hmm. and um, how it might work in the future with with the Apple um, apps App Store and, and that sort of thing and how it works on the Apple TV and and we'll also maybe even revisit this after the uh, some of the Apple announcements that are going to come up in the next couple of weeks I think yeah well of course we archive the chat and this will be up on the website this evening so thanks for all the great chat stuff that's that's yeah. uh, in this particular very I don't know if it was an exciting topic or whether you just kind of <laughs> decided to we are exciting share, people Andy share your information well I have to believe that uh, we at least sparked a conversation there so uh -huh. um, but this has been fun to reminisce and to uh, prognosticate a little bit and uh, we'll see where it goes in the future all right thanks for watching y'all thanks bye bye